morning. Hello everyone. It's Tuesday, right? Happy Tuesday. Wake up. Wake up. It's time for Dr. Pingle Live. How is everyone today out there in Instagram and Facebook? Just waiting for people to join. So hopefully you're out there. Wave, say hello. If you're out there, hey, how's it going there, Hector? Nice to have you guys here. It's Tuesday. Tuesdays are always very busy for me. I don't know why. It seems like Tuesday is my Monday. Um, so yeah, I'm a few minutes late, I think, today. Sorry about that, kids. Yes, I'm having coffee too. Wake up. <laughs> I see ya. <laughs> All right, so today um, I'm going to be talking about insomnia. And um, I have a lot of patients who have gone through this process. So um, I wanted to, to educate you on uh, sleep, how to get sleep, what happens in your sleep, um, and ways that you can improve your sleep. So um, I'm Dr. Trisha Pingle. And this is your morning checkup. It is Tuesday. I believe it's the 21st of April. Um, we are almost through April. Yay. Um, so um, I'm going to jump on in. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, I'm glad you had breakfast, Hector. I did earlier. My kids um, and I sat outside today. I had some coffee out there with them, enjoyed the weather, um, and then... Uh, off to work I go. So, um, so well, I don't see many of you out there on Instagram today. I guess maybe I'm a little bit too late. Hopefully we're over there in Facebook. For any of you that don't know, I do record both at the same time. So you may see me look between two cameras, um, but I'm here with all of you. So um, I wanna talk about insomnia. And insomnia, um, it's reported affects 30 to 35% of adults. Now, I think it's probably a lot more um, just because you don't really go in necessarily reporting insomnia. Often it comes, <laughs> often it comes as a secondary type diagnosis. Um, and for many people, it's short-lived. So they define it basically as an acute or a um, short-lived insomnia, which means it happens occasionally and is less than three months. Chronic means it happens more than three times a week um, for more than three months. Now, if you've ever had insomnia, I don't think you really care which one you are, whether you're diagnosed as short or chronic. It sucks, okay? I've gone through periods of insomnia. Um, I was like a zombie. I mean, I seriously, I know it's awful. Okay. And the hardest thing about it is that a lot of the treatments actually make the underlying condition worse. So then when you try to come off some of the medications, you end up with more sleeplessness. Okay. So I want to talk to you about some of that. Okay. Because the bottom line is medications for sleep are steadily increasing. And the scariest part is the peak use of benzodiazepines are in the over 65. Now these are people, um, I, now granted, I know an 80 year old that's probably the healthiest person I've ever seen out playing tennis and doing everything every day. But in general, the older you get, the more fragile you can become. So if you're on medications like benzodiazepines and you fall, you'll be more likely to have a more serious injury than if somebody who's 30 falls, right? So this is kind of alarming that people over 65 are taking these medications at such a substantial rate. In fact, with the opioid epidemic and all the new rules that we have, hello, all the new rules that we have with prescribing that, um, benzodiazepines are included. We have to report those. Uh, we can only prescribe so many. Um, so those drugs are really causing a problem and most journals are citing about a double, um, it's increased by double over the past five to six years, particularly in the older age groups. Now, those are, we're going to talk more about those and how they work and why we have trouble coming off of them and the physiology behind that, because I think um, it's really important for you to understand the physiology and how things work. If you understand how things work, you can make a realistic um, judgment on what you should do or what you shouldn't do. You know, as a physician, I should not be here saying, oh my gosh, never take a benzodiazepine. I think there are situations where maybe you will have to sometimes, but you should be well educated on the risks, the benefits, and if it's worth it or not. And so I think that's where we lack a lot of education. We just get the script and we don't even know what it does. Okay. So I want to go over some of that today. Um, so, um, 
More alarmingly though, are the use of the hypnotic sleep medications, uh, Ambien, Lunesta, Sonata. Now I bet a lot of you, maybe not all of you, but a lot of you have either tried them or know someone that uses those to sleep, okay? They actually, the FDA, I think it was last year, maybe around this time last year, put a black box warning on these medications. Now, I don't know if you know what a black box warning is, but there are things just warnings. Like when you open up your, um, your pamphlet for the medication, it has side effects, you know, common side effects, rare side effects. And then in some medications, there's a black box. And that's like, whoa, whoa, look at me, hello. I've been proven, we've got a problem here. There may be a massive side effect that you're not thinking about. So when the FDA puts a black box on, you need to read it, okay? Very, very, very important. Hello, Joel. So I've got a lot of you saying hi, I see you. Good morning, nice to have you here. Um, so the black box warning that they have added to Ambien, Lunesta, and Sonata are that more accidents and fatalities happen while on these medications. So what they're finding and what they found is that when someone takes these medication, they sleepwalk and they don't know what they're doing. Okay, so they wander, they're not awake. They're fully asleep, but their body is still awake. Um, now that's an important um, thing to recognize because that means that you're truly not sleeping, okay? We're just cutting off the brains recognizing a sleeping. Here's the scary part. The fatalities that have occurred from the use of these medications are carbon monoxide poisoning, drowning, falls, hypothermia, motor vehicle accidents with the person driving, and suicide. Okay, then they report non-fatal accidents in high abundance that are due to sleepwalking while on these medications. Listen to these, accidental overdoses that are not fatal, okay? Um, falls, burns, near drowning, exposure to extreme temperatures to the point where they lose a limb or almost lose a limb, gunshot wounds, and suicide attempts. So I know you wanna sleep, okay, like I get it, but there's a risk that you take these medications and it's fatal, okay? So that's scary, right? But yet I understand that desperation for wanting to take them because when you don't sleep, it's horrible. It is absolutely horrible. I have multiple patients I've worked with through this and kudos to them, ma'am, because they stuck through it. They did what we needed to do and I know it was not easy and they came out on the other side and now they're sleeping without medications or really any supplement outside of general nutrition, but it took a long time. It takes a lot of patience to overcome insomnia, okay? It's hard, but um, those medications are concerning. Isn't that concerning? Like, you just wanna to go to sleep and you end up shooting yourself or falling into a pool? Like, that's not cool. Um, so this is now an actual FDA black box warning. So pay attention to that. I'm sure many of you maybe have spouses that have taken this and have noticed sleepwalking, talking in the sleep, getting up and making themselves food in the middle of the night and they don't remember, okay? Um, I've had numerous patients report that to me. Um, so let's talk about why we sleep, okay? We sleep to repair. Okay, that is our time that we repair ourselves. That's when we repair everything that we need to do, okay? It's our general maintenance. It is critical. It's critical for the brain, the nervous system, the heart, the lungs, and the immune system, folks. If you want a strong immune system, you have to do regular maintenance, just like you would on a car. If you don't do regular maintenance and tune-ups, parts are gonna start to not work so well, right? And it could eventually cause a real serious problem that prevents you from driving the car, right? We're the same way. We repair at night in our sleep. That is why we sleep. Okay, and it's very important to access that. There are a ton of conditions that are associated with poor sleep. Um, high blood pressure, depression, diabetes, and obesity are all highly linked to poor sleep. Um, and there's also been a lot of studies the other way around where poor sleep is linked to those, to the development of those. So it goes both ways. Um, so sleep is part of our parasympathetic nervous system. Now, many of you who join these lives may have heard me mention this before. That's our rest and digest phase. It's where we repair, it's where we're calm, okay? So in this um, state, this is where we um, digest our food, absorb nutrients, remove toxins, and we do cellular repair. Um, this is where our immune system is boosted. Okay, now you've probably also heard me talk about, sorry, a little water there. 
No more coffee, folks. No more coffee. Okay. You probably also heard me talk about technology and how technology currently, as wonderful as it can be, also gives us a constant sympathetic output. So the phone keeps beeping or buzzing or, you know, emails or whatever. We're very connected as a society through technology, um, but the body will adapt to that to a more sympathetic fight or flight response, which means less time in parasympathetic activity. So we are adapting, and this is why I think we're seeing even more insomnia than we did 20 years ago. Um, we're seeing people where their body is adapting to this constant stimulation to not sleep as well. Um, this will result in poor digestion, Anxiety, I mean, anxiety rates are on the rise, folks. Um, fear, anger, sense of urgency. You know, you gotta get this done, you gotta get this done. Where's my phone, where's my phone? Those types of things, right? Where's, I didn't get this done in enough time. There's not enough hours in the day, those types of things. Um, and of course, this will result in poor quality of sleep, okay? And the less sleep you get, the less repair you get, the less calm you get, and the more stimulated you get. So you get caught once again in this little cycle of stimulation versus relaxation. Um, and that is a problem. Hello to all of you just joining. Nice to see you all. Uh, we're talking about sleep today. Um, so, um, and also if you're one of those that uses the medications that I talked about earlier, um, Ambien, Xanax, even Benadryl or Unisom, um, that's forcing you to not notice, okay? So let's think about it this way. Uh, many of you have heard me talk about the bear in the woods, right? You're in the woods, you see a bear, you run, right? It's a fight or flight response. And when you're constantly stimulated with that, and you're seeing bear after bear after bear after bear, the body adapts to that, okay, to where it anticipates a bear. So let's say that you've been running all day from a bear and you're exhausted, so you sit down behind a tree and you just wanna take a nap. So you start to doze off and then you hear a rustle in the bushes. <gasps> what was that? Was that a bear, right? Um, so you start getting, you can't fall asleep effectively, okay? Over time, you'll even anticipate the bear. You won't even close your eyes because you're worried about that bear. So how many out there, when you try to fall asleep, find yourself thinking about everything you've done all day, what you have to do tomorrow, what's coming at you, how are you gonna do this, how are you gonna do that? A lot of people prevent sleep by not relaxing when they're gonna fall asleep, okay? So let's imagine that you're sitting behind the tree, you're trying to fall asleep, and someone comes along and hits you over the head with a mallet. Out you go. But are you really asleep? Or is your brain still going, you just don't notice? You're basically paralyzed and knocked out, okay? That's what these medications do. They knock you down to where you don't notice that stimulation. Unfortunately, your cortisol levels and that fight or flight are still going. When you knock yourself over the head, you don't necessarily get rid of the stimulation. A lot of these drugs will bring up neurotransmitters that calm you, but it's a temporary binding, okay? So for example, um, if you have a, one of those drugs that binds GABA, which is a neurotransmitter I'll, I'll talk more about in a second, okay, um, that calms you down, um, these drugs bind it. So if you have all these receptors open in your brain, they bind it for a certain length of time, eight hours, 12 hours, whatever, whatever it may be. And then it releases. Okay, the minute it releases, that fight or flight is right there. Okay, it's ready to go. And this is why when people try to reduce off these medications, they tend to have rebound insomnia or anxiety. I see with coming off benzodiazepines, one of the number one side effects I see is increased anxiety. That's because you've basically been suppressing your response to that bear by knocking yourself over with a mallet, right? So when you finally don't knock yourself out, it all rises to the surface and you have a harder time coming off those medications. And it is brutal. Um, like I said, I give so much credit to the patients that I have seen that have been able to fight through that because it is very difficult, okay? But it makes sense, okay? We're spending more time in fight or flight, not enough time in repair and restore and digest, rest and digest, okay? Um, so what this would mean if you're using these medications um, is, is that you're getting a non-restorative sleep. 
Okay, so you're not building your immune system during that time even though you're asleep. You're not clearing your liver during that time even though you're asleep, right? So you still get a lack of maintenance. Your car still breaks down, but you're seemingly asleep, okay? And then if you're on some of these other um, hypnotics where you sleepwalk, you think you're asleep, but your body's wide awake. And this is testament to that. The cortisol levels are still high. You're getting up and driving somewhere and you don't even remember, okay? So it tells you that your body, you can't fight your body's natural fight or fight response. It's our survival mechanism. So it's really hard to fight. You have to support, okay? You have to support the body, not fight the body, okay? Um, so anyway, um, there are also other side effects to those medications like fogginess, lack of memory, depression, anxiety, you know, things we don't need, um, we have enough of. Um, so you guys with me? I see a bunch of comments over there on Facebook. Instagram's a little quiet today. I do have some hellos. Hello. So does anyone know, do any people know the categories of sleep and the sleep cycle and what we're supposed to do if we were not overstimulated? Let's talk about it. So um, there are basically two categories of sleep and I'm sure many of you have heard of these. There's non-REM and REM. Okay, now there's four stages of sleep. The first three are non-REM and the fourth is REM. Okay, so you go through stage one, two, three, and four. Your goal is to get to REM sleep, okay? This is a, um, why? REM is where we repair. Okay, so if you um, are, re this is where you're repairing blood cells and strengthening your immune system. If you're not going into REM sleep, you're not creating new soldiers. You don't have new troops to fight invaders, okay? And I don't know, um, there's an interesting, there's some interesting data. Actually, this is really an interesting fact. People under 30 tend to get an average of two hours of REM sleep a night, okay? People over 65 get about 30 minutes of REM sleep, okay? So maybe this is part of the reason why the older you get, the less functional the immune system to be, the more invaders get in, you know, the more pneumonia, the more cancer, Quite possibly, you don't have that repair the older you get. Um, now granted, there's exceptions to everything. I know some incredibly healthy 70-year-olds out there, um, but in general, you get less REM sleep the older you get. The less REM sleep, the less repair. The worsening immune system, the worsening uh, disease development, okay? Um, so, um, and it's also been played, you know, cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, all of these have a lot of links to lack of repair and sleep. So very, very important to get into REM sleep. So what is REM sleep and non-REM sleep? I will tell you. So stage one, this is when you guys are just starting to fall asleep. It lasts only a few minutes, okay? Um, it occurs where your heart rate and breathing start to slow and your muscles start to relax, okay? Then you move into stage two, okay? And this is where your heart rate, your heart rate and breathing slow and your muscles continue to relax and your body temperature drops, okay? Um, eye movements slow down during this time, brain activity slows down, yet there are short periods of electrical um, activity. So you spend more time in this stage than any others. So shout out to some of you that experience restless leg syndrome. Uh, typically this happens a lot in this stage where those electrical impulses are being uh, released and um, you're awake, you notice it. Where most people don't really notice it because their brain has slowed enough um, so uh, this is why a lot of the times you're prescribed a GABA agonist for restless legs, gabapentin, so that it calms the brain down so you don't really notice and the convulsive activity goes down. So if you have a lot of restless legs, there are a bunch of reasons for that, by the way, tons of nutrient deficiencies that are associated with that. In fact, that would be a great live, Dr. Pingle. So I will uh, put that one on the list. But please know also it has to do with how you fall asleep. Is there too much cortisol and stress impact going in where you're not able to relax? Hey there, yes, this is live. I have someone asking if I'm live. I'm live on Instagram and Facebook. How you doing? Long time. Um, happen to know this person. Anyway, you can watch it back from the beginning. Um, at the end, I will repost it on Instagram so you can see it from the beginning. But yes, this is absolutely live. Welcome. Um, third stage of REM sleep um, is critical. Okay, it's critical to you because this is where you go into deep sleep. Okay, you are welcome. Um, <laughs> good to see you. Um, 
This is where you go into, into sleep and this is where you're fully relaxed and your heart rate and your breathing are at their lowest levels, okay? This is very critical. Then we move into REM. Now REM is the most critical, okay? Now what's interesting about REM sleep is this is where you're not relaxed, okay? So you've relaxed, you've calmed everything down, you're sleeping, you're in a deep sleep, and then you move into REM sleep. This usually occurs after about 90 minutes of being asleep, okay? And it's the stage where you dream. You dream the most, I should say. You still dream in the other stages, but this is the most. And what's interesting is during this time, you're actually paralyzed. Your arms and legs are paralyzed to not react to those dreams. That's why you can have this dream where you're running or you're fighting, but you actually don't hit your spouse next to you. Although my husband will tell you there's been a couple times that he's actually rolled over and elbowed me in the face. Um, we make a big joke about, about that one. It was quite a dream, but most of the time you can't do that. So the spouses are actually safe. Um, but it's called REM sleep because your eyes are moving very quickly underneath your closed eyelids. Breathing gets faster. Okay. Um, and it can become irregular. Your blood pressure and your heart rate actually go up, and this is similar to when you're awake, okay? So, but this is actually the most restorative time of sleep, okay? So just keep that in mind. Um, all of this is regulated by your brain, and I won't spend a ton of time going into neurochemistry with you, but maybe a, uh, um, maybe a different time. Um, but um, it basically involves the hypothalamus, the brainstem, the thalamus. Um, the brainstem controls whether you fall asleep during that REM stage, so whether your legs and arms are paralyzed. It also has a lot to do with GABA production, so the brainstem is highly involved. Um, thalamus is where we relay information. Okay, so the thalamus is really involved in REM sleep, and what it does is it's very quiet during the early stages, and then during REM, it ramps up, it's active, and that's where you get images and sounds and sensations that fill out those dreams, okay? And the amygdala is very, very involved in this as well. So you may find yourself waking in the middle of the night with a really strong emotion, say it be fear or panic or whatnot. Now that could be simply because you were in the middle of a dream in REM sleep and most people should fall back asleep. If you're not falling back asleep, the question is, is there also a sympathetic output there and they're working together? It wakes you up and you're now awake. So it's important to dream. It's important to notice that you do actually stimulate in your sleep. That's a normal process, but you should go right back into the cycle again fall back into that deep sleep and go through it again and again. If you're waking up in the middle of the night and not able to go back to sleep, there's something amiss here, okay? Whether it be perhaps um, being too stimulated with your sympathetic nervous system or perhaps it's that you don't have enough relaxing nutrients that help relax the brain. Um, there's a lot of different reasons why this could happen. Um, so there are a few of those, hello, hello. Um, a few of those uh, chemicals that are involved in sleep, I spoke earlier about GABA, which is the mechanism how most, most of these drugs work. They bind GABA, okay, and they force it to bind, okay? Anytime you force the body to bind anything, you're downregulating other things, okay? So the body normally makes GABA from amino acids, particularly taurine, um, along with a bunch of other nutrients. So if you're giving like a Xanax and it's binding that GABA, you're not going to be making more GABA. So that's kind of one of the side effects and why um, when you start to come off those drugs, why there's so much trouble, you don't have a natural GABA buildup. Um, in your system. You don't have an extra bucket or a suitcase of GABA lying around. Um, but GABA calms the body for sleep. It's also very prevalent in low GABA levels, are very prevalent in depressive disorders and anxiety. Okay, So we've talked a lot about how stress impacts anxiety in the past. Um, I will probably do a live simply on anxiety because it's definitely an epidemic. Um, I think getting worse a lot right now in our common times, we're seeing a lot more anxiety and a lot more fear, and that is now causing trouble with sleep, right? I don't know how many of you, and you don't have to admit it here on the live, but how many of you are noticing worsening sleep since this whole pandemic happened? Because um, we're overstimulated, <laughs> okay? We're overstimulated with information um, and we need to sleep. So um, so I talked about the GABA, the GABA and binding. So GABA can actually be increased in the body by using taurine um, as well as a bunch of nutrients, which I'm gonna talk about to help build more. There is kind of a controversy on whether um, GABA pills can actually, um, you know, natural GABA pills, not Xanax, can actually cross the blood-brain barrier. 
Um, so a lot of people will use taurine. I know I commonly use taurine, which is a precursor amino acid to GABA, um, along with the nutrients. Um, that also allows your body to choose how much GABA it wants to make rather than forcing GABA there. Remember, our bodies are really smart, guys. Our bodies know what they need. They always know what we need. So if you provide the tools for the body to do what it needs, that helps and that's better and that's less side effect and it allows you to repair as opposed to just suppress the symptom. Make sense? Okay, serotonin. Many of you know serotonin. Serotonin is used a lot in antidepressive type therapy. It is also made from the amino acid tryptophan. Now here's something you may uh, not know. Tryptophan turns into serotonin. Serotonin makes melatonin. So if you have low levels of serotonin, you likely have low levels of melatonin, right? Melatonin is what helps us fall asleep when it gets dark. It's what helps sets that sleep weight cycle. So people who um, don't have the nutrients to make melatonin or serotonin often will have the side effect of insomnia. Now, people that are on things like um, SSRIs that, that recycle serotonin, um, it takes nutrients to convert it from serotonin to melatonin. So you also have to make sure that you're taking the nutrients that you're losing from those medications and from the stress or the underlying cause of why the level of serotonin is low. Many times serotonin is low because tryptophan cannot turn into serotonin or it's turning into serotonin at such a rate that it's getting removed before you can make more, you know, which happens a lot um, if there's a ton of stress. But for the most part, vitamin C, vitamin B6, very important in serotonin production and therefore very important in melatonin production. You gotta make sure you're getting your nutrients, magnesium. Minerals, guys, minerals are key, okay? Those little micronutrients that we really don't get from our soil as much anymore, a lot of the times we need to put back in, they're all cofactors in our body. What's a cofactor? It's like a little helper. So it's like, um, if I wanna care if we were shoveling rocks, my kids were shovel shoveling rocks yesterday. Yeah, right? <laughs> um, but they couldn't always carry the shovel from one side to another, so my husband would have to help them, right? He was a cofactor. He got the reaction to go where it needed to go. Wouldn't have made it quite as far with my eight-year-old shoveling those rocks, right? He had to help. That's what a cofactor is. That's what magnesium does. That's what selenium does. In this instance, that's what vitamin C does, vitamin B6. These are very, very important, and they're needed to get that reaction to go to the other side. So. Um, cortisol, um, I've spoken, I'm sure at nauseum to all of you that watch my lives, but cortisol is what's released during our fight or flight. And when you've had multiple stimulation and multiple, um, shooting up of cortisol, the rhythm starts to go like this. So it's supposed to be highest in the morning and lowest at night, and then you sleep and then it pops up to wake you up. If you're being stimulated by this bear constantly, right? If you're having all these upshoots of cortisol, you're going to have those in the middle of the night as well. So commonly what I see is people wake up sometime between 1 a.m. and 3 a.m. and then they're really tired during the day from like 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. right because cortisol is shooting up at the wrong time of day and dropping at the wrong time of day okay so must pay attention that if you're noticing that you wake up and it's you're tired but you're like ready to get up and it's like 1 a.m. and there's really no reason that you should be definitely take a look at your stress response guys take a look is there something that's stimulating that um Cortisol. I have someone asking if a multivitamin would help with sleep. Yes, yes. If it's a right formula of multivitamin, for sure. I am gonna have another live on multivitamins. I've had a few of you ask me about that, how to pick a good multivitamin. Um, so I do have that on the list. I personally take a food-based one at night. And the reason I do that is the food-based ones don't tend to keep me up. A lot of the times, if you use some of the other ones, which are great multivitamins, okay, but they have a lot of nutrients and B vitamins and they're not food-based, they can keep you up. So in those cases, I would take those in the morning. If you have a food-based one, you can totally take it at night. Um, in fact, I take take um, activated folate at night and it makes an absolute difference in my sleep. Um, so yes, you absolutely need to take vitamins and minerals and definitely eat a, a very mineral rich diet. And I'll talk about more of that in a second. Thank you for your question. Um, melatonin, we kind of touched on, um, just keep this in mind. Okay. Um, in order to produce melatonin, you need serotonin, right? Um, now, when melatonin is released, it lowers cortisol levels, okay? So it helps you sleep. Now, 
there's a catch 22 here. If you have too much cortisol going into it, um, it will impact your own melatonin production, okay? They compete in a scent. So when you're running from a bear, your melatonin levels over time will decrease. So, um, you know, someone's asking about brands of multivitamins. I wish that I could uh, report brands. Unfortunately, uh, the medical board doesn't let me speak of a specific brand, um, but I will answer your question directly after this with a suggestion for you. Um, so we talked about some of those vitamins and minerals that are necessary for sleep, and I just wanna run through those so you guys are all aware, because it seems like this is a, something you guys are responding to. So um, definitely, uh, you need vitamin C, okay? The more you run from a bear, folks, the more vitamin C you need, okay? Vitamin C not only boosts the immune system, which I think most of you know, but it's also very prevalent in adrenal function. So if you have been running from bears repetitively, your vitamin C levels will deplete. If your vitamin C levels deplete, you have lower antioxidants, okay? Lower antioxidants mean poorer immune function, okay? This is why vitamin C is a fantastic antiviral, okay? It works against most viruses. Why? Because it's a potent antioxidant. It's critical. It's critical for everything, okay? And if you're low in vitamin C, most people will notice more allergies, more anxiety, poorer stress response, and more colds, flus, viruses, and otherwise, okay? So vitamin C is critical. Vitamin B6 and vitamin B5, also very critical. Also highly drained by stress, okay? When you're running from that bear, you run out of nutrients, when you run out of nutrients, you have to replace them, okay? If you don't, you will have more symptoms such as this, okay? And it is incredibly important right now. This is what, you know, there's a ton of research. I know I mentioned this the other day. There is a ton of research on IV vitamin C fighting coronavirus and reducing hospital time by half. Why? because it's a potent antioxidant, okay? So get your vitamin C levels up, keep them up, and remember that every time you stress out and every time you panic and every time you have fear and anxiety, those vitamin C levels are going to drop and that hurts your immune system. So try to stay calm, okay? I know I'm a hyper person and I get all excited, but I'm still calm, kind of. <laughs> um, so um, that's a very important one. Vitamins B6 and B5 also deplete. Um, we also have zinc and magnesium. Magnesium is actually a fantastic, um, a fantastic uh, sleep aid. Magnesium will actually put you to sleep. Um, so that's a great one. The form of magnesium matters, and I promise this one is also on the list. You guys just have to keep coming back to learn more, right? I can't put it all in one live. I gotta come back five days a week and teach you more. So magnesium's on that list as well, as well as selenium and vitamin C. Those are all coming up. Um, so um, in my experience, I have also found a very strong correlation between insomnia, particularly trouble falling asleep with restless legs um, and low levels of iron. So if you're someone who has a history of iron deficiency anemia, you may find that you also have trouble sleeping. Ironically, I've also seen a lot of people who have a high level of storage of iron or high levels of ferritin in their blood also have trouble with sleeping. So iron is an important one. Too much, too little. You want to have just enough, okay? Um, proper nutrition can help with that, okay? I did talk um, a few days ago about probiotics, that was last week, and how important the gut flora is with neurotransmitter production um, when it comes to production of epinephrine, norepinephrine, GABA, all these things I've been talking about, um, which are all related to um, cortisol. Um, the gut flora, very important, be having a good probiotic. If you missed that live, I do have it posted both on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, okay? I have someone um, saying they've been talking a lot about zinc. They have been in treatment of corona. Yes, absolutely. And it's interesting because as we get older, our zinc levels tend to go down. So I still wonder, you know, is a lot of the reason why this virus is targeting some of the elderly populations having to do with, um, you know, tradition or with nutrient deficiencies. We really don't know, we won't know. I can't say it is, right? I mean, this is a time will tell, um, but they are treating with vitamin C and zinc. You are absolutely correct. Um, all right, um, yes. So what do we do? What do we do, folks? Um, Sam Fuego Foods, I have an article on CBD. Check it out, um, drpingle.com, okay? Um, 
Sleep routine. How many of you sleep with your phone next to your bed? On or off, right? <laughs> Most people have a phone next to their bed. Go back to the old school alarm clock, folks. Get the electronics out of your bedroom. They just cause a stimulation. Are you someone that reads news right before bed? That's not good, right? Puts all this input in that now you have to think about while you're sleeping. You process at night. When I was in medical school, the, one of the best ways to study is I would spend hours, obviously way ridiculous amount of hours studying, but then I would go to sleep. I would read the thing that I couldn't remember the most right before bed and then um, go to sleep. And in the morning, that's the thing I remembered the most because my body processed it, my brain processed it, right, in my sleep. So keep that in mind. Turn off the electronics before bed. You know, um, I've been known every so often to watch old reruns of Three's Company or something like that um, at bedtime. You know, as long as it's not imprinting someone that makes you think, you know, a lot of the times it can kind of help you doze off. But if you're reading stuff, processing information at night, it will impact your sleep, okay? So that's one of my biggest suggestions. Um, put the phone somewhere else. Also, when you wake up in the morning and your phone is there, it tends to be the first thing you check, which then puts you into a fight or flight response the minute you wake up. Put it in the kitchen, put it in a drawer, I don't care where it is, just don't have it in your bedroom. Deal? <laughs> Little house of the prairie. <laughs> um, someone's asking about cancer patients taking iron. This is all patient specific. Um, if they have low levels of iron, then they should take it. If they don't have low levels of iron, then they shouldn't, right? You never wanna, there's never a blanket treatment for everyone. Everyone is individualized. Um, uh, I see tons of comments, I'm sorry. I'm trying to keep up, guys. I might have to go back and, um, you know, uh, answer them afterwards. Um, vitamins and minerals, we've already talked about. All those ones I discussed, very, very important when it comes to sleep-wake cycles, okay? And I will try to do profiles just for you guys on all of those individual ones so that you can learn more and more about them. It's also very important to realize that you have to expel energy during the day so that you can sleep at night. If your cortisol levels are higher in the morning, that's when you need to get out. You need to move. You need to exercise. You need to expend energy. You need to burn, okay? So that we can fully rest at night and repair. Okay, drive your car during the day, park it in the garage at night and take it in for regular tune-ups, okay? Um, tons of herbs associated with sleep, some of my favorites, and I'm gonna profile many of these as well in upcoming lives. Um, valerian, one of my absolute favorite herbs, works very well, um, and it doesn't have the addictive quality of uh, GABA agonist type drugs. Um, I tend to like it in tincture, which means it's been put into an extract form. They do have it available in capsule. I don't find that it works as well in capsule. I don't. I've had kind of hit or miss response on that. I prefer to do it in a liquid tincture. Um, ashwagandha, I just did a live on ashwagandha last Monday. Probably one of my most popular lives. You guys like that one. Go back and watch it. Ashwagandha is amazing, okay? And it definitely helps calm the body for sleep. It helps support stress response, okay? Um, Passiflora, lavender, shishandra, lemon balm, um, even poppy. All of those can be taken in tincture form. Talk to your doctor about those options. Some are better for different people. If your doctor doesn't understand which one to use, seek out an herbalist or a naturopath or a functional medicine doctor in your area, somebody that can explain the differences between those and when to use them and when not to. I wanna clarify that not every herb is the right herb for everybody. We don't all fit into the same box, folks. We are all completely different. What helps me relax is totally different than what helps my husband relax, okay? Um, if you pick the right herb in the right body, there are virtually no side effects other than desirable side effects. Now, if you're trying to give an herb where it's combating with a medication you're taking, or there's a certain condition that you have that the herb is acting on, that's where you can see a side effect if you're allergic to the plant itself. I mean, all of us know that we can be allergic to plants, right? Um, you know, walk outside and sneeze, right? Um, so to always check with your doctor, but these are all valuable options worth looking into, okay? Um, essential oils. Um, lavender, bergamot, lemon balm, great ones. You can put them under your ear, you can put them under your nose, you can put them in a diffuser. Um, great, 
but great research on them as well. Oh, elderly population, uh, lavender essential oil, tons of research on that. Um, definitely, if you have an elderly person that you care for or you visit, get them a diffuser with lavender oil, have them dab it underneath their nose or what before they go to sleep or on their pillow. There has been some amazing research on that. I should probably profile that one as well at some point and I will. Pretty cool, just have to trust me at the moment. Lastly, there has been some um, Studies on weighted blankets. Now granted, you're taking a risk with the weighted blanket. If you have respiratory disease, please don't do that. But they have blankets that basically weigh like between like three and 30 pounds or something that you can put on top of you. And it's supposed to simulate like a swaddle, like a kid's swaddle. They do find uh, this helps a lot with kids that are very anxious and can't sleep. So uh, check those out. I personally do like a nice heavy blanket, but um, I definitely don't want a 30 pound blanket on top of me. So I guess that's kind of a personal preference. Um, but there, are, there is some research on that. Like it's valid, so take a look at it. Um, bottom line is, stay calm. You have to have moments where you're using the sympathetic nervous system and you have to have moments where you use the parasympathetic nervous system. As a whole, people, we are far too often in the sympathetic side and it is to our demise. It will cause a problem, okay? We have to move more towards the parasympathetic activity. Deal? So, um, if you like this live, um, share it. You know, we're all here to learn. I'm here every day, Monday through Friday, about this time somewhere between, you know, um, 9.15, 9.30-ish uh, Pacific Standard Time. Um, CBD oil, someone asked about again. I do have an article on my website, drpingle.com. I might do a live on that at some point too. Um, anyway, I want to thank you all for being here. I have so many questions coming through both sides. I need to go through and answer them all individually, and I will. I will be replaying this live on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, um, eventually also on drpingle.com. If you want to read more um, about insomnia and stress and how to boost um, or improve your sleep cycle, I do have an article at doctor, doctor, drpingle.com. Lord, hello, good morning. A lot of talking today. Anyway, thank you all. Thank you all for being here. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Go get some good rest tonight please. Okay. And much love to all of you. See you tomorrow.